Hi, welcome back. I'm so glad you chose to join me again. I'm excited about continuing our study of the hymn Amazing Grace to really look at those lyrics that I don't know about you, but I've sung so many times and to learn what wonderful lessons and treasures that they have for us. We're doing this, of course, as part of our Lenten reflection. And we're going to continue to look at this hymn that has literally been around for 250 years. It's part of the anniversary of its publication, but it's also a wonderful way to grow in our faith and to think more deeply about our relationship with God during this season. Now, last week, we began with the opening lyrics of the song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. We talked about what it is to be a wretch, what that means as unflattering as it might be at times, but what we can learn from that when we're willing to take that on and really acknowledge that what we do sometimes does make us a wretch in God's eyes. If you missed it, it's still available on both Facebook and YouTube, so you're welcome to go back and take a look at it. Tonight, we're gonna to take a look at more of the lyrics of this song. But first, will you join me and let's start out in prayer. God, thank you for this time that we can set apart. There's so much going on in life, so much busyness, so much stress, so much pulling at us left and right. And yet during this Lenten season, God, you call us to give some of that up, to give up so that we can get from you. And that's what we're doing tonight, God. We're gathering together whenever people tune in so that we can talk more about the lyrics of this hymn and how you speak to us, our hearts and our lives, and how we can learn to grow in our faith and to become stronger in our relationship with you. And so in the midst of whatever it is that we're coming from, we pray that you would give us peace in our hearts, that you would focus our minds and that you would open up our spirits to hear your message speaking to us this night. We pray this in the name of your son, our savior, Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, tonight we're going to go a little further into the song and we're going to talk about the lyrics through many dangers, toils and snares. I have already come. Tis grace that's brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Now, I realize that the song's author, John Newton, wrote these words some 250 years ago, but they resonate with us still today, don't we? I mean, I realize we probably don't refer to dangers, well, dangers probably, but toils? When was the last time you said to someone, oh my goodness, I am really stressed out by all the toils in my life. And snares? Unless you're a hunter, I dare say none of us are talking about snares in our lives. And yet, while we might use different words, the issues still face us. Dangers, yes. We can also refer to them as difficulties or challenges. And the toils? Those are the difficulties. Those are the issues, the situations that come our way that might seem to overwhelm us at times, whether they're our fault or not. And the snares, yeah, those are the temptations. Those are the things that we face each and every day. Temptations to do our own thing instead of God following God's way. Those are definitely a constant in our life. But unfortunately, so are the dangers and the toils. And so these lyrics are not just something to sing on Sunday morning. They are something that really do speak to our lives because they're speaking about our lives. We've all faced struggles. We've all faced toils and snares, the temptations, the dangers, the challenges, and all of those overwhelming situations that we find ourselves in from time to time. You may be even dealing with something right now in the moment that has caught you up and made you feel as though you're in the midst of all of that. And yet Newton doesn't just acknowledge that these things exist. 
He gives us this assurance, the assurance that clearly comes from his own heart when he says, through these, I've already come. And how? Through grace. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far. And, and not only that, and grace will lead me home. What a tremendous affirmation this is from John Newton in these words. I mean, he is not only saying that he recognizes God's grace, which if you recall is God's unmerited favor, an undeserved gift, something that we don't deserve, but we receive anyway as a result of God's love for us. That grace bringing us through all of the difficulties in our lives, all of the challenges and temptations. Then saying, based on what I know grace has brought me through already, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you can hear the confidence in these lyrics. I know that grace will lead me home. Home, of course, being our heavenly home, home with God where all of us someday will live for eternity because of Jesus, because of this grace. In the meantime, Newton says, we don't have to wait until the someday because we're in the midst of it now. We're in the midst of the difficulties, the temptations, the challenges, the stress. And he says, grace, grace is what can bring us through. Did you have any idea that grace worked like that? That we can rely on grace, not only for our salvation in the moment, but also for our ongoing lives. That is what John Newton is saying in this word. That's what we've sung so many times, whether we thought about the words or not. Now, I have to think that Newton wrote these words thinking about a time when God's grace literally saved his life. As I shared with you last week, but just as a quick renew, uh, renewal, Newton found himself at one point on the slave trading ship that he operated and in a terrible, terrible storm. I'm sure he had navigated tough storms in the past, but this one, this one was threatening to capsize the boat. It was making every man and woman on board think that they weren't going to make it alive to shore. And in the midst of this, John Newton cried out to God and asked for mercy. And there were, they were all spared. The storm didn't dissipate, as I told you last week, but they did all make it safely to shore. The boat was not sunk, and all hands were delivered safely. So I have to think that Newton was thinking about that experience on that ship, getting tossed to and fro in the waves that had to have broken over and threatened all of their lives. But I don't think that was his only thought, because if it was, if that's all he was talking about, then these words wouldn't resonate with us the way that they do. I mean, after all, I don't know about you, but I've been on boats, but never in a situation like that. Some of you may have been out on Lake Erie when the waves were getting rather high, but did you ever actually fear for your life? Literally think you weren't going to make it to shore and that you would die out there in the midst of the storm? That was John Newton's thought. It was the thought of everyone on board. But if we haven't had that experience, then either these words don't apply to our lives, as I'm contending that they do, or he had something else in mind, something broader, something in addition, that while he might have been inspired by the experience that he had out on the sea that night, was something else behind it. Well. When I think about that, I have to remember that, as I also told you last week, Newton had uh, had a change of heart after that particular storm. And that change of heart eventually led him into the ministry. And that it was as an ordained minister, actively preaching the good news of God's love and grace, that Newton penned the words that we now know as the lyrics to Amazing Grace. And so I have to think that there was part of the minister the preacher in Newton that also knew the scriptures very well by that point. And I think he knew the many scriptures that talked about how God does bring us through the difficult times 
oftentimes we may not deserve to be brought through. The argument could have been made that Newton didn't deserve to make it back to shore. After all, he was piloting a slave trading ship. A lot of people would have thought that it would have been justice had he perished out at sea. But that wasn't God's plan for Newton's life. God had other ideas. And so God, I think, was happy to save John Newton as he cried out for mercy. And it's that undeserved gift that we receive from God, even being delivered from difficult situations. Sometimes it can be argued, especially if somehow we've had a part in it, that we're undeserving of that deliverance. But even when we have no part in it whatsoever, we're completely and totally a victim. The way God comes alongside of us, cares for us, delivers us. I mean, who am I to think that the God of the universe would care about me and would care about me so much as to want to deliver me from my situation? I mean, clearly God has a lot on God's plate. There are a lot of problems in the world and mine probably don't hold a candle to anything that anyone else is facing. And yet the lyrics of the song say that grace, God's grace for us, delivers us through all of our difficulties. We don't have to get on a priority list with God. God delivers us because God loves us. And that's grace. That deliverance that we receive, that is as a result of God wanting us to be God's children. That also is grace. And so I have to think that John Newton was thinking of some of the scriptures that talk about the difficult times that we face and how God or Jesus has promised to not only walk with us through them, but to deliver us from them. And of course, there's one particular scripture that pops into mind. We find it in the 16th chapter of John's gospel. And I can't say for sure, obviously, but it wouldn't surprise me in the least if Newton was thinking of this as he put pen to paper. Beginning in verse 20, it's Jesus speaking, and he tells his disciples this. He says, I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn over what is going to happen to me, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy. It will be like a woman suffering the pains of labor when her child is born. Her anguish will give way to joy because she has brought a new baby into the world. You have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Then you will rejoice and no one can rob you of that joy. Wow. Sorrow being turned into joy. That's what we hope for, isn't it? But how much do we actually ever believe that our hopes will become a reality? And yet this is what Jesus is assuring his disciples of. He's telling them that their sorrows, their grieving will turn into joy. But that's not all. That's not the only assurance that Jesus offers his disciples. And by the way, he is speaking to each and every one of us. So please hear these words as though Jesus is speaking to your heart in this moment as well. So Jesus goes on and talks about a few things continuing to offer them promises and assurances, but then he concludes with this very important note. He says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. I think that's just amazing. I mean, Jesus knew, he knew it was going to be tough. And not only for his disciples. I mean, Jesus spoke these words on the night before he went to the cross. Just a little bit before he was arrested and began that sham of a trial that eventually led to his conviction and condemnation. Jesus knew what the disciples were about to go through. He knew that Good Friday was looming. He knew the grief and the sorrow, the pain that they would experience when they either observed or heard about his death. 
But Jesus knew that because of God's love, because of God's caring for each and every one of us, that that wasn't the end of the story. Good Friday is good because it's not the end. Jesus knew that three days later, their sorrow would be transformed into joy. The joy of that Easter morning, the joy that causes us to call out, hallelujah, he is risen. That's the joy we're preparing for. But in the midst, on our journey, there is still sorrow. There are still difficulties. There are, as Jesus called them, trials and sorrows. The disciples play, faced plenty of that in the early days of the church, being persecuted just as Jesus was because the religious leaders had turned against them just as they had turned against Jesus. And we face difficulties in this world. It may not be religious persecution because we're fortunate enough to live in a country that allows us to worship freely and without judgment. But we do face difficulties in our lives. We still face trials, dangers, toils, if we like to use that word. And of course, the snares, the temptations are everywhere. But Jesus offers us this assurance. Not only as he walks with us, will he enable our sorrows to be turned into joy. We just don't know when or how. But if we trust him, he promises that, that it will happen. But that's not all. He says, take heart. In the midst of everything, you can have peace, peace in him. Why? Because he has overcome the world. Jesus stated these words even before he had done so. What is he talking about? The world ruled by sin, which is the result, which is why all of the bad things happen. Every bad thing that we ever face, every difficulty, every trial, every challenge, every sorrow is a result of the brokenness of this world. It's broken by sin, ours and everyone else's, everything that we do. But God doesn't want us to live like that. God loves us way too much to leave us that way. And someday we won't live like that. Someday we will live in the midst of God's love for eternity. That's our joy. But in the meantime, we can also have peace. We can have peace in Jesus knowing that because he overcame the world, he will enable us to do that as well. You see, Jesus isn't just our savior. Jesus is also our good shepherd. That's the grace that we've received. Not only that salvation, that total overcoming, but the grace that whether it's deserved or not, Jesus walks with us, cares for us, guides us, encourages us, and supports us no matter what. Whether we're in a situation of our own making or of someone else's, or whether it's nobody's fault all total, but it's just the way this broken world is. Jesus says that in him, we can have peace. We can be encouraged because of the grace that we have, this undeserved gift of his presence, his love as our good shepherd. We don't deserve that. His love makes it possible. God's love for us that sent him in the first place I don't mean to tear us down by saying that we don't deserve it, but the truth is the more we are willing to admit that we are undeserving of God's love and favor, the more we receive it as this beautiful gift that blossoms in and through our lives, and the more we're able to live into and trust that grace. It's that acknowledgement, difficult though it may be, that we are undeserving. We do need grace. We need God and God's love for us. And God is more than ready to pour it into our lives in every way. Does it mean God always delivers us immediately from the dangers, toils, and snares? No, it doesn't. Not at all. John Newton still had to make it through that storm we still have to make it through the storms of our lives. But the grace we receive, the grace that enables us to have peace in our hearts, that assures us that we will make it through 
someday, somehow, that grace is knowing that Jesus has overcome the world. He is our overcomer, and through him, we can have the victory as well. Not just over sin and death, but also over everything that we face in this world. That's what I think inspired John Newton. It's what I believe he knew, what Jesus was trying to tell his disciples and what he hopes that we will learn as well. That in this world, we are going to have difficulties. There are going to be temptations and we're probably gonna be tripped up by more of them than we would like. We're going to feel overwhelmed. We're going to feel incredible sorrow. Someday that will be turned to joy. But in the meantime, we can have peace. The peace that he offers us and all of this is a matter of grace. God's gift to us because of God's tremendous love for us. I can't say it enough, enough times. So these lyrics that we've sung so many times, they're not just lyrics. We have literally been singing a promise all this time probably not even realizing it. But now that we have realized it, I don't know about you, but I want to take it to heart. I want to remember this in every moment. I want this to come to mind in the midst of my next storm, the next difficulty that I face, the next temptation, the next trial. I want to remember that no matter what happens to me in this world, no matter what I face, because of God's love for me, because of what Jesus has done in overcoming the world, I can overcome the world. He'll give me the courage that I need through the Holy Spirit. He'll give me the strength to endure through all temptations and trials. And eventually, he will bring me through. And in the meantime, he will give me peace. It's a pretty good hymn, isn't it? And we had no idea all this time. We're going to continue to look even more deeply into this wonderful hymn. Because let me tell you, we are just starting to scratch the surface into all that we can learn and all that it can mean for our lives, our faith, and our relationship with God. So we will gather again next Wednesday night or whenever you choose to tune in. And I'll have some more lyrics some more lessons, some more of that amazing grace that we're celebrating and reflecting upon in this Lenten season. Until then, let's close out in prayer. God, thank you so much for this amazing grace. Thank you that grace is so much more than we might have ever imagined that it would be, so much more than just simply our forgiveness of sins and the salvation that we receive. Thank you that we are saved from all manners within this world, including the dangers, toils, and snares that we face along the way. Thank you that in Jesus, we can have peace and assurance, blessed assurance that he has overcome the world and that as a result, as our good shepherd, he walks with us and will enable us to overcome our worlds, our situations, our difficulties as well. Bring this to mind, God, the next time we face difficulties, the next time the challenges flood into our lives. I pray for all of those who are facing difficult times, whatever the issue, the situation, or the circumstance is, God, I pray that you would remind them that no matter what, they are your child. And in all situations and circumstances, no matter what, your love is greater than anything they or we can or will ever face. Thank you, God. Thank you for this amazing promise. And again, for your amazing grace. Thank you for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. We will be back here next week. I look forward to that and look forward to sharing more of these lyrics. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Till then, be well. Take care of yourselves.
God bless us all.